And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being. And then they were still and listened more deeply. Some of them meditated, some of them prayed, some of them danced, some of them met their shadows and the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindlessness, heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together, again they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways. They created ways to live, to heal, to heal the earth as they had been healed, and then they began to live again. I would like for us to check in first, because I want to know how we're doing. Uh, that's a very, very important thing about part of being in this space. And we're doing a check-in. We really want to know how you're doing. So uh, tell me your name. How are you this morning? How do you show up in this space? How are you today, in this moment? And then if you could be anywhere else in the world, let's just say there's a spot right now that's just beautiful without anything that can harm you. If there's such a place, any place in the world you wanna be right now, where would that be? And then the one person, uh, who would you take with you? Okay, and I will begin. So like I said before, my name is Pamela Purdy. I work at Precious Blood as a restorative justice coordinator and trainer, and I feel absolutely wonderful. The one place I would go now, I was talking earlier, I think I would go to the south of France. I would go to the south of France and just hang out somewhere where it's green and trees and beautiful people. I just, and I would take, uh, I think I'll take Teresa, my daughter, because we had so much fun last night, the two of us. I've forgotten what it's like to just hang out with her. Thank you, Pam. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. My name is Fred. Uh, I'm the mentor coordinator at Press Blood uh, Ministry Reconciliation. Uh, how I'm feeling? I'm, I'm feeling well. I'm, I'm feeling energized. Uh, uh, I'm feeling excited about the day and, and, and sort of the future in general. Is there somewhere that I would I would want to be if I had an option? Uh, I don't know if if a, if a, a physical space is, is is what I'm thinking about. I, I guess it's it's a state of being. I would I would want to be in more. Uh, I, I've recently sort of diagnosed myself as a as having anxiety issues, uh, so I would love to be in a position to 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 fully understand what that means in my life. And, and how I can sort of overcome that and control that and, and use it to my advantage. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say I would, I would want to be in a better sort of mind space as opposed to physical space. Uh, so my name is Raphael and I come to this space like happy, right? So I woke up this morning in my own space. Um, 42 years old is my first time having an apartment. Right. And that felt good. So that's, that's, that also answers the other part of the prompt, because any place I could be right now, that's where I'd be right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it, it just feels adult. I think a lot of people don't understand what I mean by that. It's to, be, to have agency, to be able to choose. For yourself, right? What you do that day, how you're gonna approach that day, it's 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 it's, it's um, liberating, right? And I've never felt that before, and now I understand what that feels like. Um, I can spend it with any person. I would say my little brother. So when I went to prison, my little brother was 12. He's now 38. For 26 and a half years, we haven't had an opportunity to really just be around each other, just just me and him. Right, so I look forward to that particular day. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Brooks. 
I come feeling like I'm getting out of a state of defeat. You know, part of what I do is I try to coordinate a lot of stuff and I really rely on a lot of, of other people's responses in order to do what I need to do. I feel better though on my way here. So I'm feeling good. The one place I, I wish I was, I would be, or I could be, and with whom, in less than two weeks, it'll be 10 years that me and my wife have been married. Um, so this is surprisingly emotional for me, right? 10 years, like when we first got married, we wanted to go to Hawaii for our honeymoon. And we told each other like, look, 10 years, that's where we gonna go. But yeah, so, you know, it just so happened that this time, this 10 years, we find ourselves here. But the good thing about it is that we've been through so much that we're really taking this current moment in stride. Because like, man, our marriage has been a lot of ups and a lot of downs, but you know, by the grace of God, we continue to do what we do. So yeah, I, I would want to be in Hawaii right now on a beach, sipping a Corona or something, you know, with my wife, with my wife, you know. My name is Adolfo Davis. I feel good. And to be out of prison and to, like the brother said, to wake up in your own space without hearing no bars clicking every morning <laughs> or eating cold food, the same cold food every day. And so to be able to wake up each morning and fix my own breakfast, if I want it, if I don't want it, you know, and to wake up and put on clothes that's not the same color. <laughs> you know, so I'm very, very happy and blessed and honestly, I believe that I'm where I'm supposed to be right here and right now because and sharing it with y'all because I hope for years to be in, be right here, working with precious blood, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And making a difference, so I feel blessed. I'm Cheryl with Community Justice for Youth. I am so anxious about this baby, which is about to be. Can you imagine a new life in the midst of all this craziness? It's sort of this affirmation that we do go on and we persevere and we survive. Um, so I'm good. Where would I be? You know what? I'd be sitting outside. <laughs> I'd be sitting outside in that outside that brick piece circle meditating. Or I'd be walking the path that's right next to it, that meditative walking path. I'm telling you, when you from start to finish, it can take you 40 minutes. Hi, my name's Angelica. Um, I'm so glad to be here. I think I'm coming into the circle feeling bittersweet. Sweet being like, this is such a sense of home. And it's also such a sense of education that's comprehensive and in-depth and emotional and being able to be in community with everyone here like this is just so life-giving but it's also kind of bitter because we can't hug and we can't you know come close to each other and um so i think we're getting creative in how to do that and so i think where i would be um and during this like if we could would be a big party where i can hug everyone and dance with everyone and yeah. Hi everyone, Janet. I am really grateful. I'm more grateful to be here now after hearing two, four, six, seven of you check in. And I think how blessed am I that I get to be right here um, with each of you. Um, yeah, this is truly a graced space, place, um, and graced people. So thank you, each of you. Honestly, I don't, I think I love where I am. Um, and I guess if anything, I'd be in this circle, but I'd be a lot closer together. I'm Joanne. I work with Cheryl at Community Justice. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It was kind of hard to get up this morning. I felt pretty early because my sleep has been so disrupted with all this. Uh, where I would be, I kept going back and forth, south of France, Hawaii, south of France, Hawaii. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I have had great, 
great times in both of those places, but I'm thinking probably Hawaii because I got family already there that I would be with. My name is Joanne. <laughs> she wants us to do this. My name is Kamba. And I want us to finally turn around. That was Kamba and she wanted us to do this. My name is Fred and I want us to do a power super swap. This is Fred. <laughs> for this space and if you once we've gone around and if it's something you didn't hear and you need it then you can offer that but this is a really important piece of the space is creating values and these are values that mean something not just to you but it's also what you need from us sometimes values can be personal right like they're your family values and so and there's some of your family values are not anything that we have to agree on right those are yours that's probably your heart that's how you walk right um, values for this space um, are important because, as Tom said, they help to keep us feeling accepted and not judged. Like, how, how, what's going to make me feel like I can really open up and be honest? And so, I think for me, the first thing is actually something that you know many of us don't even think of outside of this space is honoring the talking piece. And we pass the talking piece around from person to person. It really is an opportunity to listen. You know, I find myself talking way too much a lot, you know, and I'm learning in circle how to listen. So I've got listening and honoring the talking piece. I've got respect and honesty. I have respect as well and love. The reason why I say love, I had to love myself first. So when I started loving who I was and who I am, I started moving in a way to show other people that I love them as well. So if I love myself, I can give the same love to the people that I'm around. I would say first, empathy. The reason why I would say empathy because I have a lot of experience um, going through change and walking with other people as they change and it looks a certain type of way. A lot of people may support those things intellectually, right? But when you see it in action and all the confusion and complications and so-called hypocrisies that go along with a person going through their life changes. People have a tendency of not understanding what they're seeing, right? So that is very important, doing this type of work. Mm -hmm. And also agency, respecting the fact that everybody has a voice, even if I don't agree with it, and being willing to use your voice, even when everybody else don't agree. Uh, I statements are really important to me when I sit in space. 
to uh, respond and comment only on your experience and not the group or not all women, not all men, not all people that's been incarcerated, but your own I statement, your own experience. Uh, repeat, uh, respect the talking piece because that's very important because every voice is, is very sacred and, and just by our check-in, to me right now, I'm feeling honored to be in a space with individuals that is just, to me, real powerful. And uh, so you, whenever you speak, I'm listening. And, and whenever you have the talking piece, I'm not going to speak, I'm listening. So honor the talking piece. Uh, to give and receive respect uh, is important to me. I guess just acceptance. Yeah, acceptance of people where they are. And um, uh, I would say also confidentiality. Being present in the space. You know, a lot of times we think about all the other things that's happening outside the space, but being present um, is, a, is a value. And, uh, you know, I echo what uh, Cheryl has said and others about respecting the talking piece. Um, that we each feel freedom, and, um, and I'm thinking particularly in freedom to take care of ourselves. Uh, so whatever that means, if that means... Um, um, the freedom to pass the talking piece and not share, the freedom to step out if you need to leave the space, step out for your own self, that you have that freedom. I think awareness, just being aware, we want to value each voice so that we are ensuring there is space, time and space for everybody's voice. Just close our eyes for a minute, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes. And just sit back in your chair and feel your feet on the floor and feel the chair and be conscious of the air you breathe in and exhale out. Just take a minute to just relax. Nobody has any expectations of you other than you just be who you are as you come into this space. And as you're doing that, you can think about where is it that you feel accepted? Where is it that you feel like you can really be yourself? And it's not just okay, it's valued, it's honored. So take about three deep breaths as you think about that, as you visualize that space, feel it, smell it, be there. And you can open your eyes and just remember what that felt like, where, whatever you saw, wherever you went, whatever was there. <clears throat> and if we could just do just a, a reflection round about anything that came to you or just how you felt, <laughs> what you thought, what you saw. Where I went to be accepted was, I think, dinner tables, both at my parents, my house as a kid, but also my best friend's house. And I think that sometimes family's complicated and maybe all the time family's complicated. <laughs> and there are times where I feel like totally accepted by, you know, my parents and my sibling and whoever, but it's also hard because there's expectations attached to that and there's, you know, preconceived notions. So when there was times I wanted to escape from my blood family, I would go to my best friend's parents' house and be able to kind of be myself, but in a slightly different way. So I think um, those two places are equally valuable. And I think I'm really grateful to have those options to kind of express different parts of my personality. Well, when I closed my eyes, I, was, I had to do this. It's a good feeling to be able to close your eyes and be free and not worry about watching your back and things like that so that was that was good for me so I try not to use possessive words when it comes to describing other people all right but in lack of something to replace it what I would say my lady no pretenses right can completely just be you and it's accepted. You could laugh about it, right? Stuff that, you know, you walk out the front door, you gotta put your mask on, put the right clothes on and go about your day. But when you walk in, it's like, I can hang this up, mm -hmm. right? 
And I've never felt that in my life. Mm -hmm. So ironically, I didn't realize until this morning um, that is a very relaxing and liberating way to live. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for people that can't experience that. A train ride from Manhattan to Long Island mm -hmm. to see my father, my biological father, which when I was working then in, in New York, I was making some great money, so I hired this detective to find my father. Never see my father, except for six months old that I heard he was there. When I finally found him and he told me where he lived and, and what he was doing, I would every other weekend or once a month, I don't remember, but I would get on that train at Penn Station and take that ride to Long Island, New York to be his four or five year old daughter. I never could rise to being an adult when I got there. I was always like a child because I needed that and wanted that. So it's not bad, it's good because it just felt so good. If so, and I'm praying someone asks me, where are you going? I would say, going to see my daddy. <laughs> you know, but nobody asked me. <laughs> but if somebody would have asked me, I would have said, I'm going to see my daddy. But that train ride, which I know is maybe two and a half hours, three hours, was just the best moment living in that crazy, fast fashion world I was living in. It was the peaceful, safe space. I'm going to see my daddy. And sure enough, he'd be waiting at the station. That put me back into these meditation apps I've been listening to lately. I think about my choices and my options, right? And I'm thinking about the choices and how some of them have, have sort of been difficult, right? Being an adult, uh, going through what I have went through, and people living the life they have been living since I've been gone, there's been a big gap, right? And it's sort of tough coming to terms with, 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 with facts. And, and it's like, no matter what you do on my end, you cannot change people and, and, and circumstances. So come to grips with the fact that, uh, you know, maybe I might never sort of have a, a brother and sister relationship in the classical sense with my sister, right? Uh, or, you know, maybe, you know, some of these sort of gulfs are just, you know, sort of just unbridgeable, right? And not in an angry, sort of vindictive, you know, sort of, I'm mad that, that it can't be different type way. It's just, okay, this is, this is life. Uh, you know, this is, this is God's course for these relationships. Um, and just accept that, you know, and, and sort of be at peace with that. So, uh, you know, coming to grips with that has been sort of a safe space and a sort of healing process for me. So my safe space is in my bathtub. Uh, with, with my, I've got, uh, I've gotten into this bath taking stuff. I don't even want to see a shower no more, right? Uh, uh, so with, with my comb out in the background and listening, you know, you know, listening to that. You know. I've been doing childcare. Uh, from my great niece. You know, we're not supposed to be touching people, but I hug her all the time and she <laughs> hugs me. When I put her to bed, which, yeah, her mom and dad were there, she wanted aunt to put her to bed. Um, and then she actually has this net over her crib because she was climbing out and it zips in. And I zipped her in, which she loves it. She loves that tent. Um, but she, wait, she said, wait, I didn't give you a great hug. And so I had to unzip it and she just like <laughs> threw herself at me and grabbed on. It was like, oh my God, this is, this is the greatest. So yeah, that, that's what came to my mind. Um, safe space, when I closed my eyes, I just thought about home. I thought about my house. Um, it's, it's just more than, you know, just a space for me. You know, we take our shoes off at the door. Um. You know, it's we make sure that we're all clean because we want to, you know, protect each other. But at the same time, feel free. You know what I mean? Uh, feel free to get, you know, to do to just be us. And I can't just be my silly self. Like, I got a silly side to me that you know I'm, I'm I, that's guarded. Like I guard it, right? But at, I know at home, 
I'm able to just kind of let that loose and my wife and entertain my wife and my daughter. <laughs> you know, I was an acting major. That was, you know, back in the day, I did acting plays and stuff like that. So sometimes that come out of me. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so yeah, home, home is what I thought about. I, I went to the woods and it surprised me, but when I was younger, when I was in my early teens, I remember I used to always, just when I wanted to get out of the house or after school, I would go down the end of the street and we had a conservation trail, or, or there was a trail, but it was in all this wooded land. And I just loved that. I loved being in this pine grove where you could smell the, the pine and all the conifers. And you were walking on pine needles, which are just the softest things to walk on. And there was a stream below and you hear the trickling of that. And that I think is what um, stirred in me a love of nature and, and my sense of communion in nature. So that was um, really beautiful. Thanks for... Wow, we all need that. And speaking of what we all need, what do you need during this time? You know, like what, what's a challenge for you and how are you meeting, you know, one or some of the challenges? But for me, it's not being able to touch people. It is so hard for me to walk into a space <laughs> and not just automatically go reach out to somebody. But that's a challenge and the way I'm dealing with it, and it's so silly. Well, I mean, not silly, but it doesn't seem like it's the way you would address it is I cook. I just cook. And I and, and I and I take meals to people, you know, like and I but I don't tell them I'm bringing it or I'm cooking for them because then I would be stressed. Like, oh, my God, if I didn't get it done and I, I'm don't set yourself up for too many things. Don't make too many commitments or promises. Just so to let it flow as best you can. And to me, that's been one of the best things about this time is I haven't been talking a whole lot, I've been cooking a whole lot, and I've been dropping food off to people. Figuring out how to compensate with the lack of touching. I think I've identified the people in my inner circle that will allow me to hug them. So maybe it's just a couple more hugs extra, you know, whether it's your partner, if it's your friend or parents or whatever. So that's one thing way I've been coping because it's not natural. I think some things that I need, because I have roommates who, it's really hard not to be conscious of their emotions and what they need and how that might contrast to what I need. So sometimes I'm like, I'm gonna go on a walk without you guys. I'm gonna cook a meal without you guys. Like I need some space. So figuring out how to have agency and communicate that respectfully is what I need during this time. The ability to let go of some of the peace I have right now. Um, it can get too comfortable to the point where I don't want to move. It hampers other aspects of life that requires you to move. But I can disappear into my own little world, my own little cave, right? And the rest of the world outside of that really cease to exist, right? But there's responsibilities in that world outside of that space that's a reality. And I used to be the type of person that put myself in hard situations just so I can overcome it. I'm starting to get too complacent in certain in certain situations that I need to step out a little more. But what I do at Precious Blood, I can't really do from home because I, I need to be in a circle with people. I need to hug people and I need to just grab one of the boys and sit at the end of the hall and play chess. So I miss I miss being here. I miss being at work. I miss the I miss loving the boys. I miss loving my coworkers. And so I'm dealing with it by uh, continuing to grow. I've grown a lot by just reading and, and I sit in on, on meetings and I talk to Rita in, in Oakland. Uh, I talk to uh, my mom three times a day. And so I'm just, I, I made a promise that since I love what I do so much and I love coming to work, I need to be the best person I can be when I come back to work. So that's what I'm doing. That's how I can feel that void of not being here. I'm just continuing to be my grandest self by learning more, loving myself more, caring more, writing stuff down, I'm writing everything down. So when I come back, 
I can love more and be loved more. So that's that's what I miss, and that's how I'm dealing with that. I sort of subscribe to what Rayfield was saying in terms of so, sort of things being too easy when it comes to stuff like that. Like I, I I need it to be a little difficult just to you know to learn from it to appreciate the good stuff and. Uh, I know they may seem like you're punishing yourself, but it's it's sort of, I guess, traits and habits we picked up along the way that made it nest. I mean, possible for us to do the stuff we did. You know what I'm saying? To survive, right? I would say I I I need to go to the parks and go to the lake, and it's so frustrating. I know the other morning I woke up really early and I thought, oh, I'll drive over the lake and watch the sunrise. Oh, wait, no, you can't <laughs> do that. So, and to be with more people. And so hopefully if we are careful and do like this, we can start being with people more. And um, I need that. I don't know. I, th I think I, I can agree with a lot of you all about needing to touch people. You know, when I came in this space and then when I came, I think it was last Monday or the Monday before last, I had a point in time during this thing where I actually grieved that, you know, and I allowed myself to grieve it uh, because I made a comment in my mind to say, man, I remember when I used to hug my brother, it was it was nighttime and I was washing dishes and I said, it just came across my mind. Like, I remember, I remember there was a time, man, when, when I could hug my brother and I'm like, wait a minute, what, what am I saying? You know, what am I saying? Things going to be all right. I need to remember that we are all connected. We are so united and, and it transcends the physicality. And like I said, I need to remember that we're so connected beyond that. And we feel it. I feel it when we Zoom every week. I feel connected and I'm not touching anybody physically, you know. So I need to uh, remember that and because I do need to be connected to people. And so I am more and more, I have several different Zoom groups that I am connecting with. And so it's like connecting with the larger world around us. But I get up earlier and I stretch for a half an hour and I listen to Pope Francis and his daily mass. And then I pray with my housemates and then I do some jogging on the um, you know, treadmill or whatever. So that really helps me. So maybe just think about something positive to share with somebody in here, or just with all of us in here. You know, some lines from a poem, some lyrics from a song, from um, a prayer, an affirmation. Something that when you, when, it, when you use it for yourself, you feel good. For me, I developed this one while I was incarcerated, that my future is bigger than my ego. Something I was... <laughs> Every time I found myself in a situation where the mind responds a certain type of way, I have to tell myself, what you try to do with your life is bigger than what you feel right now. Mm -hmm. Right? And that actually, that actually saved me in a lot of different uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Right? So the words, um, we are the world, we are the ones to make, we are the world, we are, we are the, the world ones to make a brighter day, so let's start giving. It's more of a concept to sort of think about and believe in when, when sort of things get rough or difficult. And that is that, you know, your life is not about you, right? I, I think that sort of recenters me and, and put me in sort of in the right mind frame when, when I'm sort of getting sort of flux about stuff. If I serve others in the way that I am supposed to, you know, that in and of itself will take care of me. So... I say that uh, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord. And the reason I say that is because it seems to me that everybody who I've talked to, everybody who I'm connected with, I'm surrounded and connected with a lot of positive people, people who love, right? Because I believe that God is love, like love. And with love, there is power, there's compassion, there is sacrifice for compassion. And these people, it was almost like, you know, he, he said, you know, this, this may be crazy. I said, it depends on who you're talking to. Because it seems as though looking back on before this happened, the people who I know 
It was almost like we were set up and prepared for this moment. It's crazy. It was like things happened that we couldn't explain. Things were moved around. It may have been good or bad at the moment that you thought it, but it positioned you in this moment to maximize who you are, to maximize the love in you. Because we see that this thing brought out the worst and the best in people, but I think the people who I know who have love in their hearts, man, that love is maximized a hundredfold in this moment. And before this moment happened, it, it was prepared. Um, during this time, this pandemic and this time of great suffering and loss and, and hardship, there's also been this outpouring of love and kindness and goodness. And I think it's important to remember that we are beings of love. Can we turn on that love? And, and love is transforming. And that's what will transform our world. It's not going to be hate and it's not going to be um, power and um, oppression and negativity. So um, I guess for me, I, I want to I pray for that grace to, to have courage, to be compassionate, to, to have compassion for people who I don't agree with and, who, uh, and pray for them and love them. In some ways, I feel like it may contradict some of the things that people have said in here, but I also think it really complements it. So it's, it's by an African-American theologian. His name was Howard Thurman. And he said, don't ask what the world needs. Don't ask that. Ask what makes you come alive and go do that. Go do that. Because what the world really needs what the world really needs are people who have come alive. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, one more, inhale, exhale. Community. Somewhere, there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catching our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us. Whenever we come into our power, Community means strength that joins us, our strength to do the work that needs to be done, arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. I think we've moved into a new era where that might be kind of like not the norm, but necessary. Because at first I thought the whole time I'm sitting here, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. But I didn't because it kept, I kept thinking about how this is going to help. And help meaning, you know, come on, at home, I don't think they're going to actually be in circle. They're going to be at the kitchen table or they're going to be uh, congregating together as a family. But they still need to know there's some kind of structure to come in together. And that's what we were doing here. And that's why it was important to me. They will see in that little piece we just filmed that no one talks over anybody. One person is talking at a time. And how did we do that? We did it by using a talking piece. Uh, it was important to create the value so people know that we're going to respect one another. Uh, we're going <coughs> to, and if it's family confidential stuff, that we're not going to take it outside of our family. They saw us model that in the circle. Even if they don't do their values, they'll know that there is something that you hold sacred in order for this to happen. So strangely enough, I didn't feel as uncomfortable because this is the first time and I've been doing circles a long time since any camera came in. We've had times when camera person came in and did like maybe the icebreaker or the principal at a school came in and talked to the, to the teachers and tell them how important it is what they get ready to do and then out the door. But this whole time being filmed, it kind of felt like it, it might be okay. Uh, like it's our baby, like we, we, we claim this. So we're gonna let this happen to our baby. We're gonna let this, let our baby be filmed. And that's why it was important because uh, people need to talk. People need to come to the table. 
with what's going on right now. People need to communicate. It sets up the circle to start to feel safe. Just naturally, you see a camera or a tape recorder, we, something happens to us. Like, oh my God, I'm being filmed, I'm being taped. You don't know where that's going. So before you even do any filming or taping, you must ask permission. And, and once I asked permission and people were okay with it, then it starts to feel like this is safe. Nothing's gonna happen where it's gonna come back to hurt me. You know, well, we, we, we have to control that the best way we can, but people don't usually mind, but they, they mind if you don't ask. And so that was one of the first things I did when we opened up the space is ask permission uh, to have us, film the, us to film the, uh, the circle. When you're in circle, you are building and creating a, a sacred space that's made up of the folks that's in the circle. So how do we do that? We always ask people to bring something to put in the centerpiece that represents them and also that has meaning. Can't just be anything you find out on, on the bookcase or whatever, say, oh, I'm gonna use this. It has meaning to you. Uh, and then in that space, if the time permits, you get to talk about uh, what that means to you and why was that important for you to offer to this space now it's important when we come to space like this and when we do circles that everybody feels important it's not just a circle keeper it's not just a person who called a circle everybody is very equally important in the space and everybody offers something to that space so it becomes a community of our stuff our important things being honest and open and if it's a person or a group of people that's not used to being honest and open that becomes a challenge but here's what happens with the process of the circle we don't just open up with okay let's talk about the problem let's talk about why we're here we do things to build that community where you start to trust so you start to feel more comfortable i see that happen a lot right after the icebreaker and I'm one of those keepers that I, I never do a circle without doing an icebreaker, which is a, could be a game, could be a funny question to take your mind off of, oh, I'm getting ready to open up, I'm getting ready to do Kumbaya. Uh, we, we, we have a challenge with our young men at Precious Blood where I work because they sometimes are coming up in a, in a community where there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of talking, not a lot of... Uh, coming together and discussing things that's hard to discuss, especially if you are traumatized or if your day, daily uh, activities is not peaceful. When you come into a space, you immediately feel, oh, I don't want to talk about uh, stuff that's going to make me feel or make me cry. And so people tend to, and we know that as a keeper, we know what people are coming to the, to the space with. That's why we spend so much time in talking about your special piece that you brought, creating the values, uh, doing the icebreaker, and checking in. Like sometimes I've done circles where we didn't get past the check-in because sometimes people really just need you to ask them how they're doing, you know? And, and usually if they tell you, start to talk about how they're doing, it opens the door now for more things that can be discussed. But first, it's important that you understand what restorative is, you know, uh, before you even start to do or talk about circles. And so we, we do do, uh, uh, we do have a space where uh, we, I do a uh, point, uh, PowerPoint on explaining what restorative is. If you come in and work at a restorative justice hub, then what is restorative, you know? And so when we start, when things happen in this space and people that, are familiar with restorative justice and doing circles, sometimes just modeling that to people who don't understand, where people tend to, even here sometimes, want to punish. People tend to not have empathy a lot. And so if someone's here modeling that because we understand what restorative justice is and it is being part of a community that shows empathy, uh, not being punitive, but uh, holding people accountable instead, uh, I've seen people transform into, okay, so maybe this is something and maybe, and our goal is to try to train everybody in the space. That's the four day training that we offer, CJY offers. Uh, 
it's important, I think. And, and pretty much a, a lot of the staff have been trained, just a new staff haven't. And that's my job to go out the new staff and say, hey, we got a four day coming. But of course, that's come to a halt. But my job is to identify those folks that have not gone through the circuit keep it, the, the, the four day. And that's not necessarily to be a circuit keeper. It's just for you to understand what it's like to be part of a community, which is what you do in those four days. And and then you'll see what's, what we're doing here. You'll see the community that we build with the young men we work with, the mothers. Uh, how we are here for them, we listen, we create a safe space, and when they walk through the door, we want this space to feel like it feels when you walk into a circle. Think of how you want to feel uh, when, we, when you think about what makes you feel safe. Think about how you would want people to treat you or how you would want to be treated in a certain situation. Uh, that's why they say sometimes people in education, if you ask someone in education that's familiar with restorative justice, what is restorative justice in the school? What does it look like? And then they would say, well, I would want my child to go to a school that is using restorative justice practices. See, I would want my daughter to be in a place where people are going to uh, build a community around her. They're not just going to punish her. They're going to ask her to talk about why she did what she did that needs to be punished. And so uh, my encouragement is to, for people to think about how do you want to feel? How do you want to be treated? And that's people having patience with you, people embracing you, uh, people bu building a, a community around you, uh, building a space around you that feels safe that you can come into. Oh, Ooh, so thank all of you. Great big stretch like this. Bring your hands in front, wiggle your fingers, move your wrists up and down, around, and then slowly bring them in, bring them in, bring them in, give yourselves a great big hug.